Thank you. Well, good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson. Tonight, Ann Coulter has canceled a planned speech at the University of California, Berkeley tomorrow, saying physical threats from the left made going there simply too dangerous. Coulter released a statement saying this, it's a sad day for free speech. Everyone who should believe in free speech fought against it or ran away. Well, after releasing that statement, she told Fox News' Sean Hannity this. I think what's going on with Berkeley, when you have, uh, it shows how radical the universities are generally. I mean, what you're talking about, I agree with, yes, they want to destroy and, cr and squelch conservative speech. But there is a separate issue with the universities right now. When you have Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Howard, um, um, Bill Maher, Joy Behar, and so on and so forth, when they're all saying, oh, get over yourselves, Berkeley, we have a First Amendment. People have fought and died for the right to free speech. You can see the rest of that interview on Sean's show tonight at 10. Well, despite sabotaging Coulter's speech by forcibly changing the date and refusing to supply facilities, Berkeley claims its commitment to free speech remains, quote, absolute, really, then why not defend Ann Coulter's right to exercise it? Aaron Hanlon is an assistant professor at Colby College in Maine. He just wrote a piece for the New Republic saying that colleges have a right to make what he calls value judgments by blocking speakers they disagree with. Professor Hanlon joins us tonight. Professor, thanks for coming on. Thanks very much for having me, Tucker. So pardon my surprise that a liberal arts professor would be defending squelching free speech. I, I read your piece in the New Republic. Outline for us quickly, if you would, your justification for not allowing people you disagree with to speak in, on college campuses. Um, sure. So um, I'm actually personally very um, speech permissive. I would say I'm very pro-speech, almost absolutist on speech. Um, but. My, my view is basically that universities, institution, institutions of higher education should be, ab be able to make value judgments about quality of speaker, not ideological tests, um, not about whether the speaker is not mob rule or popularity contests, but judgments about the quality of the speaker and, and that speaker's suitability for a speech at, a, at an institution of higher education. Okay, so free speech, and it has been defined pretty precisely by the Supreme Court, is not curtailed by other people's views of it. In other words, you have an absolute right to say what you think, uh, you, to deliver your political opinions in public. And the truth, as you know, is that colleges abridge that freedom of speech on the basis of political preference. They don't like people for their views, for their conservative views, and so they prevent them from speaking. Why would you defend that? I, I wouldn't, in fact, and that's not the argument. The argument is not that there should be a test based on the political views of the speaker. The argument is that there should be a consideration of the relative quality of the speaker and the suitability oh. of the speaker for the educational mission of, of an institution of higher education. Okay, so those are so subjective, those terms, that they allow a college mm -hmm. to stop speech they disagree with, which is, of course, exactly what happens. I can't think of an occasion in the life of the Colby College, for example, when conservative students have stopped a liberal speaker. It's always the other way around. So what are the criteria? Why is Ann Coulter, for example, who's raising big public policy issues, immigration, why is she not suitable? Well, a couple of points on this. One is that uh, if you look at, uh, it's a wonderful service by the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education. FIRE provides a database of disinvited speakers um, or disinvitation attempts. And if you look at that, you'll see that it's actually not always from the left that the disinvitation or no platforming happens. So I want to just correct that. Um, but um, well, the actually, thing is, the on, fact wait, of the stop. matter is... Can, can you name a single example where a speaker has been physically prevented from speaking by conservative students? Um, I know basically that Barack Obama and Alice Walker have been um, uh, sort of denied or at least attempted. No, they, no, um, no, they were not stopped from speaking. Nobody put their bodyguards in the hospital, nobody threw rocks against the building or pounded on the windows. Conservative students have not, that I'm aware of, and I would denounce it immediately if they did, stopped any speaker, and yet you see it on the left, and yet your piece doesn't say one word about that. I wonder why. Well, I, I actually am pretty explicit in that piece and in other pieces about my, my opposition to um, any kind of violent or disruptive protest of any speaker of any ideological persuasion. 
Right, so okay. I won't be. I wouldn't defend any of that type of action. And at Berkeley, of course, we, the, uh, the 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 conflict is not just left-wing radicals being violent. It's also right-wing radicals putting on body armor and coming there for a fight as well. Okay, but the right-wingers, to the extent they exist, are not the ones who stopped a series of speakers from speaking. They were 100% on the left. And you don't mention that in your piece, and you don't suggest any punishment for those people. If you're a near free speech absolutist, as you claim you are, what should happen mm. to people who prevent someone from expressing his or her political views? Well, as I've, as I've said and as I've made very clear in my public writing, um, I do not support anybody of any ideological persuasion forcibly shutting down speech. The issue is that conservative groups on campus have intelligently discerned a strategy whereby they invite speakers who are deliberately provocative, often oh. not interested in actually debating ideas and fulfilling an educational mission in their visits to an institution. They invite those speakers, and quite frankly, a lot of people on the left fall into that trap. We, so, so really, you're blaming the victim here because people are, quote, deliberately provocative. Can you hear yourself? You're a college professor, and you're against intellectual debate that's, quote, deliberately provocative. Shouldn't it be deliberately provocative? Intellectually provocative, I mean, intellectual debate was the, the word that you used, but I don't think I would characterize um, Milo putting up pictures of students and professors um, and at his talk and making fun of them as intellectually provocative. That's provocative. And there are plenty of places that students, faculty, and anybody else can go to get provocation that's not particularly well thought out. I mean, that's what the internet is for. So should we then turn our institutions of higher education into a kind of Wild West style um, sort no. of recapitulation you of should the allow, internet? <laughs> you should allow some diversity of views, and you don't. And so you're saying basically well, these people's views aren't worthy of hearing. We're editing them out. Why not burn their books? Why is it different, what you're suggesting? Um, <laughs> Um, no, it's a serious because question. I, because you can read their books. No, it's, I, I, I take the question seriously. I mean, the point is that a college has a mission that extends beyond simply provoking students with whatever material is out there. There's no ban on students reading Ann Coulter's books. But there's a ban on There's no ban on students getting involved in any kind of politics. There's a ban on hearing mm -hmm. Ann Coulter on campus. And, and colleges, as you know, blame the speaker for inciting the violence of others who disagree. And I guess my question, as it, someone who says he supports free speech, where is the punishment for the people who are prohibiting the exercise of free speech? Why aren't you mad at them? You seem to be blaming the people who dare to have ideas you don't agree with. Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm of course, mad at uh, people who are shutting down speech forcibly, right? What but should happen to I them? I think that... Should I, they be expelled? I, 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 I'm... Uh, I, I, I'm not really in the, uh, it's not my interest in adjudicating punishment to these people, Why not? in, in I mean, other words, because it's not my role. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I don't do not that. I'm not role. a disciplinarian. You just wrote, look, you just wrote a piece making apologies for people who shut down free speech, trying to create an intellectual framework to justify fascism <laughs> in effect. And now you're saying, I can't comment on that? It's a really simple question. If a student prevents a speaker from speaking, what should happen to the student? It's a question that's beside the point of the argument, which is that colleges should be able to have uh, standards for the speakers that they bring. Yeah. Boy, liberals used to defend free speech absolutely. Thanks, Professor. Heather McDonald.